So we've been doing some lectures recently on the topic of awakening our Kundalini energy and activating fourth density energy within the body. I did a lecture or a video this week rather on um, connecting the law of one's concept of the dual activated body, which is a third and fourth density energy body in activation simultaneously, uh, connecting that with what we've been talking about here as really the Shakti force right at the base of the spine and that those are actually the same thing. So Kundalini is actually fourth density energy or the green ray body that's lying in potential waiting to be activated. So we, we give the uh, practice of Kriya Yoga in this master class as a supplementary practice you can do to enhance what you're learning and moving through in the course. And we've been talking a lot about that in the last month or two to kind of dive more into the potentials that are there for you to unlock in this practice. And so in following up with last week's conversation, I want to move now to talking about the phenomenon of Kriyas as they begin to arise during this practice. And a Kriya, you know, I've told you before that the Sanskrit name of Kriya means the action of cleansing. And Kriya is a word that is used in Kundalini Yoga, Siddha Yoga, Hatha Yoga, and Kriya Yoga to, to differentiate something that's coming up as a result of that awakening Shakti. So when Kriyas begin to manifest, they can manifest in an infinite variety of ways, but they are essentially signs that something's being cleansed from your energy body or your physical body. So I want to talk about Kriyas today because we've come a long way in our sort of lecture series of understanding how this energy is awakened, what it is, the metaphysics of it, the neurology of it. So now let's get today a little more into the practical aspect of how this begins to unfold in your own life, practically speaking. So I want to talk about um, first the importance of prana because so much of what we're doing in Kriya Yoga and breath work is um, using the breath to pull prana into the nervous system and move it around the nervous system. So a quick review would be that we talked about the last few weeks, how there are two aspects of being, we could say of our being, <clears throat> we have the absolute aspect and the relative or the unmanifest and the manifest, or we could say consciousness and energy, masculine, feminine right? Many different ways we can describe these two polarities. So let's stick with the absolute and relative, right? So prana, prana is that which connects the never changing field of the absolute, the unmanifest with the ever changing field of the relative or the manifest. So prana is that link that connects the two. Prana is, we could say, uh, shaped by karma. So we really have these two aspects that create the manifest universe, prana and karma. Everything in the manifest relative field of being, which we call the universe, has karma. Yeah, even a rock has karma. Uh, it has first density rock karma, right? That's why it's appearing as a rock. Energy has organized itself into that pattern of expression we call rock because that pattern of expression is prana and karma. Does that make sense? A tree has second density karma called tree karma, right? We can go on and on. So a good analogy is that just as the ocean is stimulated by wind and gravity, we could say prana, that ocean of energy, Shakti, that ocean of energy called prana in the whole universe is stimulated by the wind and the gravity of karma. You get that? You see that? So prana plus the activity of karma is what creates the mind. We've talked about this a little bit as well in some of our past lectures. We've said that the mind is energy, right? The mind is just energy expressing itself. So what makes that expression what it is? What makes Aaron's mind what it is? Well, it's my unique configuration of prana and karma is really all it is. So if we just reduce everything down to these variables, 
it, it gets us gets us back to that question of which came first, right? The chicken or the egg? Um, I prefer the uh, the seed or the tree, right? Does the seed create the tree or does this tree create the seed? Which one is it? And the answer is both, right? The tree creates the seed, but the seed also creates the tree. And that's the progression of evolution throughout the whole universe. So really when the big bang happened or happens, because there's been an infinite amount of big bangs, right? That big bang is prana and karma. Prana is the energy, karma is the force that moves the energy outwards, right? To start forming the known universe. So they, they, the two polarities actually exist simultaneously at the same origin point because they are one. Masculine and feminine, uh, prana and karma, manifest, unmanifest, whatever we want to call them. It, they go outwards in opposite directions, right? To create the universe. If we trace them back, they, are, they originate at the same point and they are one at that point. So consciousness and energy are one phenomenon of, of the creator expressing itself. It sort of appears to be two, but we can see how it's not two because how could energy be known without karma? Or how could energy be known without consciousness? We could say it that way too. It couldn't be known, right? There needs to be a witness, an observer, an awareness to witness energy manifesting. And that witnessing principle is masculine, the masculine principle. The manifesting principle of energy, vibration, is the feminine. And we see this in the, again, the traditional kind of uh, romance narrative of Romeo and Juliet, right? It's the masculine pursuing the feminine. Uh, the masculine tends to be visual in nature, visually stimulated by the feminine, attracted to the beauty of the feminine. I want to see the feminine in all her nakedness. And what does the feminine want? She wants to be seen. She wants to be seen in her beauty and her perfection by the masculine. These are the two principles of the creator, consciousness and energy. So we could say that prana activates karma and karma shapes prana, right? My karma is what determines the configuration of my mind and personality. All my past lives, all the things I've done in this life, my mistakes and shortcomings and my successes um, all go in to create my current karma. So what we're doing in Kriya Yoga or any kind of breathwork practice, you know, spiritual practice at all. We are trying to cleanse the karma, right? The negative karmas and remove those karmas that keep us sort of nailed down or crucified to the cross of third density consciousness, of ego consciousness. All of our past actions of I'm a body, I'm a person, I did this, I did that, I feel this, I think that, that's all my personal karma. So when we fill the mind and the nervous system with prana, we start activating those latent karmas in the system. So the karmas in the deep ocean of being manifest to the surface of the mind and they start expressing themselves in the mind. So this is what the practice of Kriya or, or neurotropic breathwork, Kundalini yoga, practices that are about opening the nervous system and filling it with energy they are designed to do exactly that, to stimulate the karmas in the system and allow the being to burp them out, so to speak, so that they can be seen and healed and expelled from the system, right? So the way that this will play out <clears throat> is that these Kriyas will manifest again in an infinite variety of ways. We've talked about some of the most common ones, which uh, typically are kind of the burning heat throughout the nervous system. In the central nervous system, we have all the different nadis that move through the body. And these are the connecting points between chakras. And nadis, just like chakras, also need to be cleansed. Sort of like a, a river leading to a pond, leading to a river, leading to a pond. You know, the, the river connects the water from each pond. And if that river gets full and clogged with moss and algae and, and tree, bark and stuff you know we have to clear that stuff out so the water can flow freely water representing the prana so you'll feel this burning sensation typically start to happen and when you do feel any kind of burning sensation i get them a lot down my arms right here um there must be a kind of a knotty that goes down in front of the bicep 
um, down the sides of the chest or the front of the chest, all through the back of the spine, of course, all down the legs, especially down the forearms and in the hands and the fingers. You'll start noticing through this breath work that you'll just be sitting on the couch. Typically it happens when I'm reading or when I'm sleeping. Um, I almost always will wake up with incredible burning through my whole body. And it's not painful, but it's very intense. And that's the presence of Shakti moving through your nervous system, beginning to clean things out. And apparently this process can go on for a very long time, years and years and years sometimes, uh, which for me it has been, but it's been gradually increasing, I would say. Um, other times there will be deep craving for meditation. You'll want to spend more time in meditation. That's Shakti calling you to, for more purification. Something in you just begins to settle down because you know that, oh, a transformation is taking place inside of me. And this is the whole purpose of a human birth. So this is the most important thing I can devote myself to right now, to devote myself to my own evolution uh, is really the purpose of, of coming to third density, right? Whether you're a wanderer or not, this is the reason we all come here. So <clears throat> you'll crave meditation. You might crave doing Kriya breath work multiple times a day, sometimes two to three hours a day, you'll just find yourself lost in meditation. Uh, that's another very obvious sign that this awakening is happening, but more subtle signs <clears throat> than the burning or the uh, craving for meditation. One of the other things that happens is uh, Shakti will begin to move through each one of the four bodies of consciousness, which we've also discussed in brief. We have the physical body, called the gross body, the energy body or the subtle body, which is the nervous system, the causal body, which is the deep subconscious void aspect of what we are. This is called the bliss body in uh, the Upanishads. So when you get lost in a meditation and you experience lots of bliss, you could say you've entered your bliss body, meaning you've gone beyond the physical, you've lost consciousness or awareness of the physical body, and you've even gone beyond the energy body. Even sensations are not pulling your attention anymore. You're so plunged into the depth of your being that now you're connecting with that body within you that is pure bliss. That's the causal body. And then we finally have the super causal or the great causal body, which is pure consciousness. So it is that body which can witness all three of the previous. It's the body that knows the causal, that knows the subtle and the physical body. Something is aware of them, right? That's the great causal body. And that's what's even beyond bliss of just pure God union. So Shakti begins to move through all of these bodies one by one. And a typical, very, very typical uh, manifestation of uh, or a Kriya that will happen is you may be sitting in meditation and literally become overwhelmed with sexual lust. And if that happens, that's a sign that Shakti is moving through and purifying the physical body because she begins in the root chakra, right? Which is the energies of sexuality and survival. So any sexual impurities you might have or traumas will usually be the first thing you start to notice gets purified. And I just want to say before going on any further that no matter what the Kriya is, whether it's the burning sensations, craving for meditation, thoughts, traumas, feelings, emotions, things popping up, uh, you, you always wanna handle them with the exact same disposition, which is just to be like a mute spectator. Like imagine you're on a surgical table and there's an operation being done on you, Shakti being the, the doctor, and you're under anesthesia, so you can't move your body. You know, you have that kind of halfway lucidity of what's going on, but you're, you're kind of feeling the instruments doing their work. Um, you just have to observe. Don't participate, right? Don't get involved in it. Don't make a story out of it. Don't make a big deal about it, especially. Just know Shakti's doing her work. And this is a really beautiful aspect of this awakening process of this fourth density energy of love coming alive in you, that you will develop a relationship with Shakti as she moves through your mind and your body. Uh, when she begins to expose something through a Kriya that manifests, she will always give you the awareness of it. And this is one of the kind of hallmarks as well, that 
something in you just knows. You don't know how or why you know, you just know that this is a Kriya manifesting from Shakti doing her work. She's, she's making something available to me. She's bringing something up to be healed and cleansed. And really this is the dissolution of the universe of the personal self. In the same way that we have the Big Bang, right? We're born and the ego is born and we go through life collecting identities and stories and attachments. And then we suffer, suffer, suffer. Something in us goes, I wanna be free. And it's like the expansion of the personal universe begins to retract now. And the implosion process begins. And that's the destruction, right? The destruction of all that is false in, in the illusion of Maya, the illusion of the universe of my personal self, my whole personal world, all the things that have happened to me that I think define me, she starts to destroy those things. That's why Shiva is also called the destroyer, uh, being representative of the void at the third eye. When you see something through the third eye, the third eye destroys it if it's false, right? If it belongs to the ego. And so Shakti begins this dissolution within you of everything that is untrue, every trace of karma. And really what karma is, if we have to simplify that, is any sensual impression that has ever been stamped into your mind. Anything that leaves a footprint in you, whether positive or negative, is what we can call karma. So that's why they say the sage has no karma because they are not reacting or being um, pulled at all by life anymore. Whether something challenging happens, they just allow it. Nothing in them can resist it at all. It just moves right through them, right? Like wind through an empty tunnel. Or if something great happens and something beautiful happens, they let the full impact of that beauty be felt, but nothing in the sage clings to it and says, oh, this is my freedom. I wish I could keep this moment forever, right? That's what ego does. So the sage is not capable of being impressed by life anymore. They're just pure witnessing, pure presence, right? So if something leaves a, a, a impression in you, it means you attached to it or part of you wanted to cling to it, which means it was a pleasurable thing or something in you wanted to fight it and resist it, which means it was a negative or challenging thing. So anything that you've clung to or pushed away is your karma and Shakti is going to bring that out. If it's ever been there, it will come out. And so getting back to the Kriyas, <clears throat> sexual lusts typically will happen where you'll just become like viciously aroused or something in meditation. And you're like, what in the heck is going on here? And that's an obvious one, right? That this is sexual impurity. Not, not that lust is impure, but the, the, pull the the gravity that lust has over you is being brought to the surface so now you become the master of your sexual energy through shakti you tell the body when you want to be aroused if that makes sense so that will happen um likely many many times but each time it happens it'll be a little less potent and you'll feel like you have a little more mastery over it whether there's images that make themselves known or trauma memories that make themselves known or just pure sexual arousal is there. Either way, just be the witness, right? Don't, don't make a deal about it. Don't make a story out of it. Just let Shakti do her work. Trust her, right? She knows what she's doing. Uh, strange and vivid dreams is another one. Your, your dream life will likely become a lot more active when this energy awakens. Shakti just amplifies everything, right? So your dream life will be amplified and you'll start making a lot more sense out of your dreams typically. The imagery will be even more archetypal and obvious to you of like, oh, I can see what that was representing. And this is how your subconscious mind is speaking to you, right? Through dreams, there's certain things in you that want to be healed and they'll appear to you in dreams often. And if there's a really like burning desire in you to be free, to be awakened, You'll likely have dreams of serpents and kundalini activations, which represent that there's a whole lot of juice in the tank for you, which is a very good sign. Uh, this is a, a really weird one, which is random cravings for sense pleasures. That will, I mean, when this shows up, it's always the strangest experience because it'll be, it'll have no context usually. It'll just, some sense pleasure craving will just happen that maybe you haven't you know, enjoyed since childhood. I can give you one example. Um, growing up 
my sister and I would, uh, my mom would make a meal for my sister and I when we were in a rush to be fed or whatever, which was uh, spaghetti with butter and lots of Parmesan cheese. So like buttered spaghetti noodles with Parmesan cheese. And man, we used to love it when she would make that because it's just, it's so gratifying to the carb cravings and the cheese cravings. And so I had not, I kid you not, I haven't thought about that meal for at least 20 years, I bet. <clears throat> but at one point, this was very recent, maybe less than six months ago. <clears throat> the memory of that meal came in my mind one day and I was like, well, I haven't thought about that in a long time. And, uh, and then the memory was gone. It was just a random, you know, 10 second experience. But a few days later I was napping and, uh, I woke up in the middle of my nap and I felt, or I, I smelled that exact plate of warm buttered spaghetti with Parmesan cheese. Like someone had stuck a warm plate right under my nose. And I thought my first thought was that Selena was cooking it. And I'm like, why is she cooking that right now? Oh boy, that smells good. And the craving was there. And then, you know, common sense set in and I was like, of course, Selena's not, we don't even have spaghetti in the house right now. So this is just a Kriya. And I literally said out loud, wow, that's amazing. Because I was so blown away at how real the smell was. It was just like it was right in front of me. Oh, I could taste it in my mouth. It was so real. And so I just knew I had that instant knowing this is a Kriya an old craving for this meal that was from childhood, right? Some karmic remnant of an old craving is just arising to be burnt out. So I just allowed the smell to be there. It was there for about 10 minutes and then it was gone. And when I think about that meal now, it has no, I have no desire for it. Nothing in me craves that anymore, but it needed to be expressed through the mind, if that makes sense. So this can be, again, any variety. It doesn't even have to be food. It can be, for to watch an old tv show um i've i've read a book from um a kriya yogi master who talked about getting a random urge to cook and he he just had this impulse to go to the store and buy all this pottery and cooking gear and equipment and then all this food and he came home with a car full of you know groceries and cooking equipment and just started making all these meals and like he was freaking gordon ramsay and he said, I cooked for three to five hours a day for two weeks is all I could think about. And then all of a sudden one day, just boom, it dropped out of my mind completely. I had no desire to cook at all. And I literally threw all my pottery cooking stuff in my cabinet and never touched it again. It was just some Kriya that just wanted to be burnt out. It needed to be expressed somehow. So every unfulfilled desire in you that hasn't found expression or even that has, will have to be felt at some point. And typically, again, Shakti will make it very known to you that that's what's happening. This is a Kriya manifesting. And you'll have the, when you know that there's a, a built-in strength that's there to say, no problem, I can sit with this craving or this thought or this memory or this feeling. Sometimes it'll be overwhelming grief, like someone you love just died and you don't know why you're feeling grief like this or hopelessness or anger any, any variety of emotions, right, can appear. Uh, strange behaviors may manifest. Uh, old behaviors from junior high, high school, you may have these weird things starting to happen in your personality, and you'll just notice the, the urge to give into those behaviors, and you can just know, okay, that's just arising. So you don't even have to give expression to it, but you have to let the feeling and the energy be there without participating in it. Just let Shakti do her thing. And then on a more positive note, um, we've talked about this as well, and I talked about this in my video this week, is that goddess awareness, where as you move through each Kriya, these blockages get removed in the mind and in the nervous system, and the mind becomes increasingly stabilized. The mind starts to be equalized and balanced. You feel your mind has more power, more strength, and more capacity for that fourth density energy. And that always shows up as love because that's what fourth density is. So you will literally be mesmerized by clouds and the blue sky and people and literally anything that has energy can invite you into a realization of God. 
And that's what I call goddess awareness, right? You're aware of the alive, intelligent energy that permeates everything. And it's just incredibly blissful and, and wonderful beyond description. And if that's flowering in you, also, you know, for a fact, this energy is manifesting greatly. 